All right, the part of the chapter here I want to draw your attention to is starting in verse number 13. The Bible reads, Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. And what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is about your children and protecting your children and making sure in this wicked and evil and adulterous generation that your children can still grow up godly and serve the Lord. There are a lot of dangers out there. And what we see here in Job chapter 39 is the, the um, description of an ostrich. An ostrich that has her, you know, lays her eggs and then just buries them in the dirt somewhere and then forgets about them and leaves them. And spends no time, spends no time making sure that no one's going to come along and trample them and kill them and break them and eat them and whatever else. She just puts them there and says, okay, that's taken care of and then goes on to whatever else. And the Bible says that this is an example of a beast that God has deprived wisdom of. This is not wise. It's a foolish being to take her young and just to, to forget about them and leave them open to all the dangers of the world and not protect them and look after them. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And we see here that the big problem with the ostrich is that it's deprived of wisdom. Giving knowledge is one of the best ways to equip your child with what they need to be protected from evil and from evil situations. We need to be diligent in teaching our children that, you know, about all the problems of this world and everything that's going on. And it's, it's funny, you know, you hear people saying, oh, you're, you're raising your children to be sheltered. Has anyone ever heard that before? You know, because maybe we don't let them watch the filthy television. We don't let them do all these various things. We don't let them just read any book. We don't let them just do, you know, do whatever they want, get on whatever websites. Or do, you know, we don't allow them to do that. You say, oh, but your children can be so sheltered. Well, first of all, being sheltered isn't a bad thing. If you, if you think it's such a bad thing to be sheltered, why don't you, you know, later on tonight when you're ready to go to sleep, just go ahead and, and lay down in the grass and just, and just go to sleep and just have no shelter. It gets pretty cold at night here. I think everyone likes to have a little bit of shelter. Now, on the flip side, you know, there is a problem with just being sheltered all the time and never going out, never doing anything, and just, well, I'm just going to live in a bubble and stay at home. We need to find that balance. But sheltering your children is a good thing. We don't want to just be like the ostrich who doesn't shelter her, her children at all. Just leave them out there and just say, whatever, I'm done with them. We need to be very careful, especially with our young ones. The Bible talks about, and I, I just brought this up recently, so I'm just going to read it for you. In Ephesians chapter 4, it gives you know, all the various reasons why God has provided apostles and teachers and pastors and, and He's given men to fill these, these roles within the church. And it's, because, it's, it's for our edification in the church. In uh, verse 14, the Bible says that we henceforth be no more children. So it's likening us in, in needing church and needing a teacher and, and, and learning from men of God because we ought not to be children. And what are children? It says, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So the reason why it's important to get into church is important to listen to these pastors and these teachers because they're going to teach you from God's word and they're going to help you so that you're not like a child that's easily deceived. Because let's face it, children are easily deceived. It doesn't take much for, to trick a child in general. I mean, you offer them, that, that's why, you know, when I was growing up, you hear, you hear about the stories, you know, guys pulling up in their van, hey kid, you want some candy? Real easy to trick them and deceive them. And that's how a lot of kids end up getting kidnapped and stolen and murdered and, and having all kinds of horrible things happening to them. Why? Because it's, easy, it's like taking candy from a baby, right? 
They're young. They're defenseless. They, they need to be protected. They need to be sheltered. They need somebody looking after them so that the wicked people of this world don't get to them. Deuteronomy chapter 6. But that's why it's important to start off with giving them knowledge, giving them instruction, equipping them to understand there are bad people out there, to understand how to deal with situations. If by some chance mom and dad happen to not be around, you get separated, something happens, what are you going to do in those situations? They need to know. You cannot ever assume that your child's going to know what to do. That is the worst thing that you can do. Never assume. You need to be diligent and you can't just say something one time and expect them to remember everything that you say. Teaching your children requires going over it with them over and over and over again. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. The Bible reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. Look at verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. This is talking about God's word. This is talking about God's laws. He's saying this needs to be extremely important to you. You need to teach them, not just teach them your children, you need to teach them diligently unto your children. Diligently means you're not leaving anything undone. You're not, you're not missing anything. You are going to go through all of it and you're going to make sure, hey, if nothing else gets done today, I'm going to make sure that my children get taught. That's being diligent about it. That's making sure that this happens. And, and the way that they do that here, he's saying, look, not only do you teach it diligently to your children, you're going to talk about it when you're in a house. You're going to talk about it when you're walking by the way, when you're in a car trip. Look, you talk about these things over and over and over again because we need to get these things hammered into our heads and especially into the, kid, the, the heads of our children. They need to be equipped about the evils of this world and about what's doing right in the eyes of the Lord. What is doing good in order to face the wickedness of this world? Now, one of the problems that we have with children, especially as they start to get a little bit older, is they have a tendency to think that they know everything. And look, this is human nature. This is the way, this is the way that I was. This was just about every other teenager I knew growing up. You think you know everything. And this is the point where you want to turn off the pastor and say, yeah, yeah, whatever. He's going into this again. But look, there's certain things that you won't understand completely until you start getting a little bit older. That's the way life is. There are people that have lots of experience, that have years and decades and decades of, of experience just living this life, being around other people, and, I, and I, just, I have to plead with you to just listen and accept some wisdom that's being taught to you today and to, and to not just think too highly of yourself that you know everything. And look, this applies to children and adults. We need to be humble in our learning, in our understanding, and always have room to grow and to improve and to understand things a little bit better. But especially with the children, that's why parents, it's so much the more important to be going over God's word, going over the good, the bad, everything in between, the, you know, what God wants for us to do, the people, you know, the wicked that we saw. We just finished our Proverbs series a few, you know, a couple months ago. And how many times it talked about the wicked, the wicked, the wicked, the wicked people, the wicked doers. And that's, I've already proven that, that it's not just talking about your average sinner. Now, you still, you have enough to worry about just from your average sinner. Let alone the people who are out and devising mischief and can't sleep until they're doing harm to somebody. Those people exist. And these are the people that, you know, when you try to bring your children up right, when all of their exposure is to good people, to people who that are trustworthy, people who are nice to them, people who are friendly to them, it makes it that much more dangerous when that person comes along that's a predator. Right. Because they've gotten so used to everybody they come into contact with being good. And that's when the, the damage happens because they end up being too trusting of people in general. Now, I'm going to say this right now, and this isn't to, you know, a blight on any individual in this church at all, but with my children, 
in my diligence to protect them and keep them safe, I'm never going to leave my children with any of you in church, ever. Amen. Okay? And that has nothing to say about your character whatsoever. I love all of you. I don't think there's any predators here among us. I, I mean, that's, that, that's my belief. But you know what? I'm not going to trust my children with anybody. Amen. I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. The only time I'm ever going to think that there's an infiltrator or a predator or someone like that amongst us, it's going to have to be with some evidence. For sure. But... Just because I don't think you're a predator doesn't mean that I'm going to leave my children with you because I don't want to take that chance because the predator comes in as a wolf in sheep's clothing. The predator is the one that no one ever realizes is that way. It's always the uncle, the cousin, the coach, the pastor, the whoever, fill in the blessing, someone, so whoever is trusted among the people, that is always the one that comes in. You hear it. I mean, you hear this over and over and over again. And again, kids, listen up. Because you don't realize this, only having been around on this earth for just a few years. <coughs> Even just learning and gaining wisdom from the amount of stories that you hear, just decades and decades and decades. You see the patterns. You see what's going on. We need to be aware and be diligent to teach our children. Now, the book of Proverbs is a great place to start. You see in many of the chapters it being addressed specifically, my son, listen unto my commandments. My son, you know, do, you know, here's instruction. Receive instruction. Don't forsake the wisdom of thy mother and in, you know, in, in the, the laws and the commandments. The book of Proverbs has a lot of wisdom. We need to be teaching that to our children. Now, <clears throat> When it comes to sheltering your children, we do need to shelter them, as I mentioned earlier, to keep them from the evil. And one of the biggest evils, I believe, in our day is the Internet. Yeah. Now, I don't, not, that's not to say the Internet in itself is just pure evil. We use the Internet. We use, we're using the Internet right now. Okay, we're streaming this sermon live onto Facebook. The internet itself is just a tool, but the problem is that it's a, it's a door that opens up to all kinds of wickedness. And this is an area where when you're not on guard, there are people lying in wait to deceive. There are people that, that you know, unlike any other time in history, I mean, think, think about this for a second. Now, think about how ridiculous this would be. Say, I don't want to shelter my children, so are you going to bring your six-year-old down to the strip club, down to the bars, down to all these places that you would never want them even thinking about going into? It's ridiculous. Well, you know what with the internet? It's a click away. Yeah. And way worse. Right. I mean, it used to be the, air, you know, the things that you can find on the internet these days, most people would never even knew existed or how to find them or how to stumble upon them in real life where people are actually doing this type of stuff. Nowadays, it's a click away before the worst type of filth imaginable can just be brought up right in front of your eyes to just feast your eyes on that. Not only is the, the, the weird deviant sexual immorality and stuff, that that's what's being pumped the most. That's what's most common, the pornography and all the garbage and nonsense on, on there. But not only that, you have all kinds of people spewing all kinds of, of various false doctrines and philosophies of men that are also going to be dangerous. Look, as, as parents, you need to be helping to mold your children one, to think critically, and that's extremely important, but to show them and teach them the Word of God. God's Word is, is without fail, and there are people that are always trying to shake our faith in God's Word. The devil's always attacking, and there is plenty of that available online. And see, the problem with the Internet is that you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know what you're, where the source is that you're reading from. You could be reading something completely made up and have no idea that it's made up. It's just found it online. It looks reputable, but how do you know that? Right. How do you know what you're reading is true? How do you know it makes sense? Who is the person that's writing all this stuff? Would you really want to get... Now, think about this for a second. Would you really want to get all of your great wisdom and understanding and philosophies and the way that you can see the world from, say, someone who's just a serial pedophile? This is how they live their life. This is what they do. This is what's going on inside their mind and inside their heart. But they're writing all of these you know, profound blogs or whatever. 
right? Is that, is that where you want to get your information from? Is that where you want to get your teaching from on, on your philosophies and life and, and how things really are? I mean, you can look at the fruit of the people who are, who are putting this up. And on the line, you can't do that. You have no way of knowing. And that's why, again, you know, <clears throat> I'm not saying you can never read anything from anybody or that challenges your faith. But with children, they need to get the foundation. They need to be taught the Word of God. That way you can test what you're, see, what you're reading, what, you know, the, the different types of information that you can receive. And as parents, you better be dead sure you know where your children are going online. Yeah. It, is a, it, is, it is way worse than just letting them loose in the Wild West. I mean, I would never dream of just dropping my children off, just go do whatever you want, just go to the city and just we'll go down to Phoenix and just... Okay, kids, go have fun. Go, go see what you can get yourself into. Have a good time. As you've got thieves, as you've got wickedness, as you've got all kinds of just the elements out there. Well, at the same time, I'm not going to let them go just run free online either. Right. We need to be diligent to make sure you know what's, what's being trying to be crammed down your child's throat or what, what, what they're being influenced with on the internet. You must be <coughs> vigilant when it comes to what you allow to enter into your child's mind. We're constantly trying to monitor because we receive, we, we, we're really blessed with like our family members and different people. You know, we've received a lot of stuff and um, I'm always trying to monitor, you know, every book that they receive because they get books for different event, you know, birthdays and, and holidays and things like that. And they'll get games and they'll get videos and, you know, all these different things. And we, we have a, a very, you know, have a limit on what we allow them to watch, what we allow them to see. You know, there's certain documentaries that, that, that are educational and I think they're just fine and there's nothing wrong with them. But we need to be diligent to make sure that we're not just saying, oh, well, let's see what this is with the kids watching it first. We need to make sure beforehand that there's not going to be any garbage in it before letting them do it. And look, it's hard to do that. It's difficult. Because you start to trust certain things. You say, oh yeah, we let them do this. And then it's like, boom, then they hit you with something else. Then there's some, some false teaching, some wickedness, something worldly that's just trying to influence your children. And the attacks are coming all the time at your children. Whether, you know, children's books, Teaching you various things. You know, we, um, I think we only have a couple of books, but I'm not even a big fan of, who remembers the Berenstain Bears? Remember that? I remember that growing up. I used, to, I used to read all their books and stuff and loved them. The stories were great. But you know one of the things, that, and, and they're subtle influences. But even in those books, what do they teach? The dad is just a big dope. The mom runs the house. The mom's the one basically telling dad what to do, and everything that the dad does is just wrong and stupid and... and He's just a big joke in the family. And that's how those books are. Now, you can look at it and say, oh, what's the big deal? But when you have this just continually being normalized through reading all these various books. Now, look, do I let my children read a Berenstain Bears book? Sometimes, you know, we have a couple that, that, that aren't that bad, but we read them first. There's some that are way more overt than others, and, we, you know, and there's some that are way more subtle than others, too. But... And I'm, am I saying that those people, the Berenstains, were wicked or whoever, you know, whoever, you know, Jan and Stan Berenstein? No, I don't know. But you know what? It's really worldly, if nothing else, right? I'm not saying that the intent there was necessarily to corrupt my children's minds. But we have certain values. We know what the truth from, from the Bible says. We know that the Bible says that the dad's the head of the household. And if I'm going to be influencing them by, you know, or allowing them to be influenced by anything... I want it to be what's right and not just what's a little bit perverted, a little bit screwed up, a little bit not right. They need to be receiving, and, and that's what it does, you know, the, especially with the media, it normalizes you to a certain way. And people, especially with the television, have gotten too used to the way that things are. And that's, and, you know, you see families on TV, you see situations that are like real life situations, and you start to think that that is normal. And, and what, you know, whether it be the fornication and adultery and the things that are just, just real common 
on the TV screen, you start to think, oh, well, yeah, I mean, my husband, my wife isn't really paying attention to me. And, you know, and you've just seen this over and over and over again, and it's gotten into your head that, well, this is what, this is what everyone else is doing. I mean, our divorce rates are out of control. That's what, I mean, what are you going to do? That's what everyone else is doing, right? It's just normal these days for people to be divorced and remarried. You're just swapping, swapping wives, swapping husbands. And you see, you see it all the time on the TV. It's normal. And see, when things become normalized, then it's not that big of a deal. Right. And, and you're not treating it the way that it ought to. And this is, this is why it's so important to be monitoring all this stuff. And again, especially with your children. Now, if that monitoring of your children's, you know, whether it be internet, whether it be videos, whether it be books, whatever it is, if that becomes too burdensome for you, you're not able to do it, it's way better to just remove that than it is to just allow these things to go through. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of damage can be done to a child by just allowing the wrong things, especially when it comes to the internet. The internet's probably the worst thing. Yeah. But you can do, you know, damage can be done to the way a child thinks way more than just about anything else when they still need to be trained and taught by their parents. Even obedient good kids need to have their content monitored. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> there are real dangers out there. And we're going to see in 2 Timothy chapter 3 what the Bible says that the the perilous times that are coming, and I believe that are here. This is the world that we live in. And this is why it's so important to make sure that our children are being raised properly. And one thing that'll, that could save your child's life is to teach them that there really are bad people in the world that may try to offer them nice things and that may try to, to, to be real friendly to them, but in the end will end up hurting them. I mean, we just had an instance the other day when we went out for Elizabeth's birthday, we went to Olive Garden, and nothing happened except my daughter came up to me after she, you know, she's old enough now to go and use the restroom by herself, but we like still make sure, you know, I can't go in there, but, you know, if at all possible, we usually have still have one of us going in there with them. But I'm standing right outside that door. I'm sitting right, you know, right at the entrance. So if I could hear anything, you know, and they're always instructed, you know, if anyone does anything, you, you know, you yell out, you get away, whatever. We teach them all this stuff. But when she was in there, she came back out and she was in there a little bit longer than usual. And she said, well, I, I met a, I made a new friend. And you don't make friends in the bathroom. Right. That is not the place to make friends. Now, do I know if that person was extremely wicked or not? I don't know. It might have just been some friendly lady that, that was being nice to a seven-year-old. That's what I would like to think. But there are all kinds of horrible things that happen in the bathroom. And I had to instruct her and say, you know what? You, are, you tell people, I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. I'm not allowed to talk to anyone, especially in the bathroom. You just come out right away then when people try to approach you and do that. And the kids need to hear that. That's just one example. These things happen all over the place and it doesn't even necessarily take very much time. We need to be vigilant at, in the protection of our children. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible reads, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. <coughs> we see this huge list of the way that people are going to be in the last days. It's going to be perilous. And, and this is where we're at. 
You can look at how many people today are lovers of their own selves. How many selfies do you see? Look at me. Look at me. Look where I'm at. Look at, you know, it's one thing to take a picture and want to have a picture for, you know, for your family or whatever. But when you're just walking around all day and, and you just, every single day you're just posting yourself and everything's about you, you're a lover of your own self. That's, it, that's that simple. Covetous, looking at things you don't have. Boasters, proud, those things go hand in hand. Blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy. Living wicked lives without natural affection. This is talking about the sodomites, the homos. They don't have a natural affection. Truce breakers, liars, right? False accusers. But then look at this as they're incontinent and fierce. They can't be satisfied. And they're fierce. They're, they're dangerous. Despisers of those that are good. That's especially important to pay attention to because if you're trying to be good and do good and do what's right according to the Bible, they're going to despise you. They're going to hate you and try to destroy you. And we need to be aware of that. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power there from such, turn away. And then again, it goes on to describe that they, they creep in. They're lying in wait to deceive. They're creeping in to, to the people that they think that they can uh, easily manipulate and control and, and, and uh, destroy, ultimately. And it says that they're reprobate concerning the faith. And what I'm going to spend probably the majority of the rest of the time on this morning is getting across the idea that we need to protect our children from sodomites. Because they are wicked people. They are reprobate concerning the faith. And we need to watch out for that. They're predators and they're always out trying to recruit children. That's why you see all the, the child molestation going on. And it's, and it's by these homos. It's by the, the, the sodomites, as the Bible calls them. We are not inviting these people to our church. You ought not to invite them to your house or have anything to do with them. They're wicked, and if you care about your children, if you care about my children, if you care about anybody's children, you're going to keep them as far away from the children as possible. Amen. This is probably you know, the number one thing in the, area, the era that we live in. Not the area, but the era. Our area is actually pretty good about this. I don't, there's not too many that I've noticed, but they're all over the place, especially in the big cities. You go around, you need to keep an eye on your children. I mean, really close. <clears throat> church is supposed to be a safe space for children not for the sodomites right. we're not making safe spaces for those that hate god for those that are that are deviant and and just wicked in their in their life i mean that's that's not you say oh but the church is a hospital not for the sodomites it's not right. there is no fix there is no cure for that Amen. once you've been rejected by god you're rejected And what we need to look out for, in addition to just the sodomites, I mean, that's, that should be pretty obvious. And I know this church has heard plenty of sermons about how wicked they are. But we also need to watch out for the deceivers that are trying to belittle the danger associated with the sodomites. Right. Those that are coming out of the independent fundamental Baptist movement and they're trying to downplay the wickedness, they're trying to downplay the seriousness and the perverseness and the just total reprobation of these people and just try to get you to be more tolerant and accepting and just, oh no, they're really not that bad. Oh, it's just a sin, just like any other sin. You know, don't worry about, it. hey, you're a sinner too, so how can you just, you know, all this nonsense that's going to get your guard down and, and, and can, you you know, confuse you enough to let your children just, okay, well, they've got a sin. They're dealing with it. God's working on their heart. Maybe they'll get over it. No way. And one of the ministries, and I feel like i got to speak on this, and, and many of you might have already heard about this. Some of you probably haven't. Is a, There's an independent fundamental Baptist that's put out a book called Born That Way After All. And I'm not going to get in too much. Into, I'm, I'm going to be reading. For, I went on to their website, and they have various articles posted. And what's happening is that they're speaking out of both sides of their mouths. Now, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with, with the names and the movement and stuff, 
Bob Gray Sr. has been a big name in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. He's done a lot. He's done a lot for God. I mean, I'm not calling the guy, you know, a reprobate. I'm not saying he's a false prophet. He's done a lot of work for God in the past, and he's done a lot of great things, and he's got his, you know, Bible college and all these other things. He's been, he's been a great soul winner, but what he's done is he's promoted this book that was, that was written by these two guys that, I, you know, I don't want to make false accusation, so I'm not, I'm not going to, but I'm extremely skeptical of, of, of these people and what their real intent is anyways and, and what they are like on the inside for releasing a book like this. And the problem is that Bob Gray isn't even backing down from this. And, and look, listen, to, uh, what, what do you think when you see, here's a book, it's called Born That Way After All. What are you going to think that's about? Who is the one pushing the, oh, we're born that way? We're born, who says that? It's the queer community, it's the, it's the sodomites. They're the ones that are making the claim, oh, we're born this way. Oh, we're born with this natural attraction to the opposite gender. They're the ones that have been pushing, born that way, born that way, born, trying to get you to accept that this is the way that we're born, this is the way God made us, this is natural, this is normal, because we were born that way. And they come out with a book that says, born that way after all. Like, as you know, confirming that that's true. Yes, they are born that way after all. But then their spin, when you read the book, is that, I mean, they name it that, first of all. And they say, oh, but that's not really what we're saying. Then why did you name your book that? Shouldn't we abstain from all appearance of evil, first of all? But it's not, just, it's not just they named it something stupid, because they did name it something stupid, but the whole teaching is stupid, and what they say is that there are people who are, they take one, one verse in the Bible that talks about eunuchs. Now, does everyone know what a eunuch is? If you don't know what a eunuch is, a eunuch is basically someone who's been castrated. It's a man who's been castrated. Okay, that's basically what a eunuch is. That's the, they try to redefine what a eunuch is, and they say, no, see, there's these people that were born eunuchs, which means they don't have a desire for people of the opposite gender. And they were, they were born that way by God in order to serve God and in order to do these various things, right? So we look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul never got married, and he did all kinds of great things for the Lord, right? But see, the problem is that they're saying that these, you know, these people who commit sodomy are just, they just got confused. Really, they were just eunuchs, and somehow they got confused and ended up doing perverted acts with someone of the same gender just because they don't have any type of, of sexual attraction to anybody. Does that make any sense? If, listen to this. If you don't have any attraction because God made you to not have a sexual attraction to anybody, how in the world are you going to end up going to bed with someone of the same gender? That is something that is naturally, I don't care who you are, I don't care, I don't even care, you know, like, I don't believe this to be true, I think there's a false doctrine anyways, but even if you were to say that there are people that God has just given this gift to that they just don't have any desire to want to have that physical relationship with anybody, Fine. I, I mean, go ahead and teach that. I don't care. But if you're going to say that, don't say that somehow a person is going to get confused and do something repulsive and do something that's going to turn the stomach of any normal person naturally because these sins, and they won't deny it, these sins, the, the sin of homosexuality is against nature. It's not against nature for some. It's against nature for all. It is completely unnatural. God didn't make something that's just more natural for them. And I'm going to get to that in a minute because they actually said, and see, they speak out of both sides of their mouth. I'm going to be commenting on various um, portions of articles that I pulled off of their website because they're making a very different claim now. These people, they're trying to say, oh, we're just misunderstood. Oh, the, and, and they're trying to turn this into a, a reprobate issue as opposed to just, no, you're teaching an extremely wicked false doctrine that's actually endangering children and they're, they're, they're influencing many churches to accept this doctrine that, oh, the, and, and what they're doing is they're downplaying the sin of sodomy. They're downplaying that these people are predators and trying to get you to accept, and, and I'll read it for you just so you can hear it for yourself. The first problem that they have is with labels. Now, who is it that's always worried about labeling? Don't label me. 
It's the liberals. It's always the people that are, you know, it's the sodomites. You know, oh, you can't label me. I'm transgender. I'm, you know, gender fluid or whatever. Don't give me labels. I don't want your labels. Now you have independent fundamental Baptists saying, oh, don't label. Don't label people. And it's just full hypocrisy anyways. Because they don't like the labels of homosexuality or bestiality, all these other things. They say, oh, this wicked man made up those terms and now you're just using them. And it's just a label. If it describes what someone does, then it's a pretty good label. I mean, I'm sure they would have no problem with someone labeling them a soul winner. Right? Do you have a problem with being labeled? Does that just mean, oh, no, no label. Don't, don't label anybody. Don't label them. Because labels are all bad. No. They're trying to, to, to speak to the wickedness of this world and they're trying to, you know, they're opening up their doors and saying, come in, sodomites. Oh, we're hearing what you're saying. Yeah, we don't like labels either. Labels are, I'm going to tell everyone that labels are bad because that's what they say. Because they don't want to be marked and called out for their extreme perversion and wickedness and, and that they're predators. Here's what they say. When the church uses these labels, we endorse and validate them. We buy into the lie. Calling yourself, and look, they have a problem, look, they have a problem with calling yourself straight. If you say, I'm a straight man, they've got a problem with that. What type of independent fundamental Baptist is going to uh, have a problem with you saying, I'm a straight man? You're using labels. And here's what they say. Calling yourself straight degrades them as crooked. They are crooked. They're perverted. They're way worse than crooked. They're perverted. They're out of the way. It's disgusting and unnatural. You two, you're calling them queer. You're implying that they're crooked. Hence the term queer. To imply they are odd or weird. Oh, I'm sorry, but I thought that the Bible says even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You know what that word queer means? Strange, weird, different, strange flesh. I'm sorry to, to hit you with Bible terminology here, but going forth after strange f flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's what the Bible says about the sodomites. They are crooked. And I don't have any problems implying that they're crooked by saying I'm straight. They say, stating that God created you unchangeably heterosexual immediately implies that God designed them irredeemably homosexual. And this is then their, their logical fallacy, right? Because now they're adding some things. Oh, stating that God created you unchangeably heterosexual. No, God didn't create us unchangeably heterosexual. That's the false premise right there. God made us naturally heterosexual. That's the way he naturally made us. It's not that no one can become because there are people that become that way. But see, they're trying to combat because they're saying, well, they're not born homosexual. But the name of their book and ministry is called Born That Way After All. Makes a lot of sense, right? That's real clear, isn't it? Sounds like someone who's really trying to, 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 to be clear with what they believe. Saying you're, they're born that way after all. Oh, but you're not born homosexual. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> so they say immediately implies that God, uh, as neither of you had a choice when you were born, this is degrading and is biblically incorrect. Then they go on to say, worse yet, it only encourages and perpetuates an us versus them mentality. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I, there, there is an us versus them mentality because there is the, the children of Belial, which are children of the devil, and then there's children of God. And then there's everyone in between who, who hasn't become reprobate or saved yet. And those that are children of the devil, they're children of the devil. And they cannot become a child of God once they've already been reprobate and have, have been born again unto death. The us versus them mentality. Oh, do you mean the us versus them mentality that's been promoted by those that did right in the eyes of the Lord. I'll read for you 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 11. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. That sounds like an us versus that mentality. You know what? I'm going to do right by God and I'm going to get the sodomites out of the land. Amen and amen. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. 
That is a good thing. That is the right thing. 1 Kings 22, 45, now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Jehoshaphat is another godly king. And the remnant of the Sodomites which remained in the days of his father, Asa, he took out of the land. So Jehoshaphat goes and finishes the job that Asa didn't quite complete. He, says he didn't get all of them. There's still a remnant. There's still a small amount of them that remained in the land when Asa went through and tried to get rid of the, the Sodomites out of the land. Jehoshaphat's like, yep, you're getting out of here. Again, a good thing in the, in the sight of God. King Josiah in 2 Kings 23, again, you don't have to turn there. The Bible reads in verse 7, and he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. And that's, that's not in there by coincidence either. You know, the Sodomites are always trying to get into church. They're trying to get into the house of the Lord. It says where the women will have hangings for the grove. They're infiltrators. They're trying to get into churches. And now they've got this big wide open door from the Born That Way Ministries to, to be accepted into Baptist churches. Here's another quote from one of their articles. Pastor, they are sitting in your pews every week. Every week. <laughs> Not at this church. <laughs> there are men and women in your church who have remained single. Some have done so out of the consecration to the Lord. Others, however, were born without an attraction to the opposite sex. So now, I want to point this out because this needs to be clear. They're claiming it's without an attraction to the opposite sex. If you didn't have an attraction to the opposite sex, what is the likelihood that you're just going to go and... I mean, I don't, I don't even want to think about it. Just do some things with, with someone of the same sex. How are you ever going to be inclined to do that even once? How do, how do you get from not having an attraction to being attracted to the opposite gender if that's the way that God made you? you that's not something you stumble into. I'm sorry. It's not something that, oh, I was just confused because... I'm not attracted to women, so I guess I must be attracted to men, even though I'm not? I mean, it would make more sense for them to get involved with women because that's the normal. Even though I'm not attracted to them, to, to try to have a relationship with a woman. You're not going to say, well, since I'm not attracted to them, I'm going to see if somehow I'm attracted to a man. W what? I'm going to keep reading here. It says, Their singleness is the result of accepting that God-given uniqueness. These are the eunuchs who were born to be such. They are amazing and unique individuals. A pastor would do well to understand their potential and to put that potential to effective use in the church. Let's look at the uniqueness of these eunuchs. Now, the reason why I pointed out is because they start off making a more reasonable statement of just saying, well, eunuch is someone with no sexual attraction, right? No, they're not attracted to the opposite, opposite gender. That's reasonable enough to try to buy into this, but then you're going to see in other places where they are talking about the Sodomite. They are talking about people who have gone and done perverted acts. With other, and, this, and this is where the whole problem lies, is that they're, they're, they're mixing their words and, and making them mean two different things to try to teach you their perversion. It says, ironically, the vast majority of pastors have driven these unique individuals away from the very place they sought refuge and hope. Listen to this, because this is, this is where it comes out. They're saying that the eunuchs are people without attraction to the opposite sex. Some of those we have driven away have even become leaders in the LGBT movement. And he's talking about eunuchs. And these are eunuchs that have no attraction. They're leaders in the LGBT movement. Yeah. Has any, have you ever seen these leaders? In the, in the perversion movement. I mean, they are so God-hating, like, way... Rep I mean, they're going to be splitting hell wide open and going and burning in the lowest parts of hell. These leaders in this movie. I mean, have you ever seen any of them? And he's saying that, oh, m many of these people have become these leaders. But they were just eunuchs. And these are the things, here's, I'm going to read two of the seven points. The article had seven points is uh, the great attributes of a eunuch. Number one, big red flag. Number one, they can be trusted. 
the very nature of being a eunuch is trust. Eunuchs were given enormous amounts of authority and trust by their masters. That is why single individuals are some of the most trustworthy workers within churches. You can depend on them. They love to please and will always do their best to accomplish the responsibility given to them. Now, again, there's the, this single individuals. Why well, don't have a problem with single individuals? But they're mixing all these different concepts together. They're saying they're eunuchs. Look, I was single until I was, you know, 30 years old, 31 years old. I was single. But I wasn't a eunuch. I would consider myself to be trustworthy and dependable and all these things and a good asset to the church. And I was focusing on serving the Lord while I was single. But I wasn't a eunuch. Not, not by any definition, <laughs> not by their definition, not by the real definition. So do you see, I mean, they, they, they throw these sentences in there and they word them in a way where you can be like, well, yeah, okay, yeah, single people, yeah, they're serving the Lord, that's great. But then they throw in the, and they become leaders in the LGBT movement. Look, that's never going to happen. That never would have happened, no matter what, you know, like, for any born-again person, that's not going to happen. Number four, they have a deep and sincere love for people. Some of the sweetest and kindest people are those who were born eunuchs. Typically, they love working with other people, listen to this, and can be trusted to care for them. They are usually excellent working with children. They have a patience that is unique, and they also have a unique discernment of people's needs. They're telling you to trust the eunuch Someone who's not going to claim to be heterosexual. Someone who's not going to claim to be straight. Someone who has, I have no desire, but I'm struggling with this sin of homosexuality because I'm a eunuch. <laughs> They're excellent working with children. Yeah, let your guard down. Let these people that are saying, look, I'm not going to let the married people watch my children, but I'll tell you what, I dead sure I'm not going to let some single person be watching my children. Absolutely not. I mean, at least with married couples, you have some accountability if you're going to leave them with someone. And look, I don't encourage doing this, but at least you have some more accountability there that if one of them's wicked, at least they have to be answerable to the other person that's in the room. I definitely, a dead sure I'm not going to leave them alone with children if they're just all by themselves. No accountability. And this isn't even just talking about necessarily a normal person. This is talking about a eunuch. People who, some of which have moved on to be leaders of the LGBT movement. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. This is just, and, and again, I'm taking excerpts from various of their articles to expose what they're really teaching. Because if you confront them with this, and this is what they've been doing lately, because there's, there's been a firestorm online over this in the past couple of days. Because of, one, because of the people whose names are associated with this have been pillars in the fundamental Baptist movement. They have been very strong influences and, and men of God that have done good work that now are compromising, that now are, are get, gotten sucked into this for whatever reason. But we need to beware of the subtlety and of, and of the mischief that's plotted against our children. 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 12. But these as natural brute beasts. Brute beasts is a stupid animal made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. This is describing cursed children, children of the devil, people that are, it says their spots and their blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. It's talking about the false prophets and the people, the reprobates that creep in and they're, and they're around you. And it says that they have eyes full of adultery. They cannot stop from sinning. Now, I know I'm a sinner. I know that you're all sinners. 
But I don't go through my day just not, just cannot stop sinning. I just cannot stop sinning ever. Like it's just a continual sin with every thought, everything going on in my life, everything I'm doing. These people cannot stop from sinning. We have walking in the Spirit, walking in the flesh. Walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. There's definitely plenty of times when you're not just sinning. These people cannot cease from sin and they beguile, which means they trick or they deceive, unstable souls. Unstable souls, they're going to be people who are maybe just newly saved, newly converted. They're going to be people who maybe have some mental issues, handicaps. They're also going to be little children because they're not stable yet, because they still need to learn, they still need to grow. These are the people that they go after, the easier marks, the defenseless, the people that have no one looking out for them. And that is exactly what they do. They beguile unstable souls because they're predators. Now, supposedly their ministry helped out this eunuch, right? Because again, we're talking about their eunuchs. And they posted this letter as, hey, praise God, we helped out this person. Now you tell me, why would they post this if it's not who they're talking about? Keep that in mind. This is, this is a letter from, from a, a female. My daddy is an assistant pastor, and I, I had became a Christian at an early age as well. Yet I struggled with my identity and why I felt the way I did for a long time, I developed a sexual attraction that I couldn't get over. I thought eunuchs don't have attractions. I thought they're just, God just made them not to have that attraction. I developed, a, this is what she said, I developed a sexual attraction I could not get over. And then goes on a little bit and says, however, by my senior year in high school, I became sexually active. I felt a sense of freedom and acted out my fantasies and feelings. I had an emotional and physical affair with another girl. And she said, initially it felt incredible and yet at the same time I felt wrong. Here's someone who in their heart is burning in their lust for someone of the same gender. I'm sorry, but that, turn if you would to Romans chapter 1, that is not who they're trying to say a eunuch is. Then why are they pushing this up there? Why are they including the sodomite that has a burning in their lust for someone of the other gender as this great example of someone that they're helping through their ministry, through their book? Because they're going to tell you, oh, no, no, that's not who we're talking about. We know that sodomy is a sin. We know that, that you know, we're not saying that sodomites are eunuchs. That's what they're claiming. But then they're posting up these letters saying that this sodomite got helped by their book because she's a eunuch. Romans 1 explains exactly how people got that way because they weren't born that way. They became that way. Romans 1, 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever for this cause. And it goes on in context earlier than that, basically saying when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, they became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. You know, they, they basically, they knew who God was, they heard the gospel and they rejected it and didn't want anything to do with it. Okay? They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. It says they changed the truth of God into a lie, worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen, for this cause. For that very reason, that is the reason why God gave them up unto vile affection. Vile means disgusting. And in order to, you know, well, what's the standard of affections? Well, it tells us, what is it vile? For even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. If you have a natural use, that is natural. That is natural for everybody. That's the way God made us. But they change that into something that's against nature, but God gave them up to even do that. God gave them up into these vile affections. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. 
Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And this is where I'll stop for a second and just say, there may be people out there that have committed some type of an act that is vile and wicked or were involved somehow in, in, in that type of an act that were not burning in their lust one towards another. Sure. Okay. The reprobate, the sodomite are the ones that they are burning in their lust one towards another. Right. Now you say, well, how could that happen? Well, many people are abused. Mm -hmm. There are people that might get really intoxicated on drugs or whatever, and they're in some weird situation, hanging around a bunch of reprobates. And I mean, I don't want to even go into details, but I could see how these things might be able to happen, okay? Like once mm -hmm. or something, or if you're being abused, you know, repetitively, but... <coughs> that doesn't mean that that's what you're looking for and that's what you're after. Those are the people that, like the article I just read, like this, I had these desires for someone other, you know, that's when you're burning in your, in your lust for the same gender. That is a sign, a clear sign that you've been given over that way by God. And it says in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They're not normal. They're not natural. They don't do those. You, don't, you never do those things naturally, but God gave them over to that reprobate mind, that rejected mind, in order to even do those things. <clears throat> I want to go to, let's see Yeah, I'm going to skip ahead to this point. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip. There's, there's some, I had, I had, well, maybe we'll get, maybe I'll get to that at the end. But. <coughs> I'm going to read this last quote here because it fits in with the Romans 1 anyways. So here's, here's what he's saying, and, and they made this in a newer article and posted trying to be clear about what they believe. And I don't remember which one of them, because there's a few people involved in this ministry and they all write their, their various articles up on their website. <clears throat> but he wrote, um, for example, I know people who drink alcohol and never became drunks. They gave up alcohol without a second thought. Others have fought a very serious battle against alcoholism. The same is true with drugs. The same is true with rage or anger. What he's doing is saying that some people are more disposed to get into certain sins than other people. This is the point he's trying to make. He's saying, you know what? Some people, they could have a few drinks and they never ended up becoming drunks. But then I know other people who they had a few drinks and they ended up just becoming alcoholics. And he's saying, but you know, like you could have various issues. And I don't disagree with that statement at all. Sure, some people are impacted by certain sins more than other people, right? Right. That makes sense. But then he says, the Bible says that uh, there are sins that easily beset us. Therefore, I believe that a person can be born with a more likely disposition to fall into an unnatural lifestyle. Now, you know what he just said there? He said that there are some people that are naturally more likely to be unnatural. Right. Does that make any sense whatsoever? No. See, the thing is, and what, what people don't get, homosexuality is not natural at all. We have a sinful nature. We are inclined to steal, to lie, to do various things for various fleshly reasons that our body wants us to fulfill, to get drunk, to do drugs, to, to look at pornography, to do whatever. These are natural things of our sinful flesh, but going with a person of the same gender and committing some perverted act is not natural at all. Your flesh is not going to be telling you, hey, you should go and commit this sin of lying with another man or another woman. It's repulsive and it's disgusting and it's not the way that God made us. And nobody is more inclined to go against nature because it's not natural. It's not the way God made any of us. There is no more of an inclination. Having more of an inclination to a natural sin makes sense. 
Having an inclination naturally to something that's against nature makes no sense. And that's what he's stating. It's funny, and then he goes on and says, I believe all sinners can be saved, and I believe all sinners can be delivered. He says, there is probably not a sin you can name that I have not had the privilege of leading someone to Christ who is guilty of that sin. I have seen their lives transformed. I believe the power of God is greater than the power of sin and that His grace reaches farther than sin could ever go. What's really interesting about that statement that he makes is in this exact same article, he quotes the verse that states that there is an unforgivable sin. That whosoever blasphemeth the Holy Ghost shall not receive forgiveness. You know, not in this lifetime, neither in the world to come. He, he, he has that reference in his article and then he goes and says, I believe all sinners can be saved. You just referenced the part that said there's some sinners that can't be saved because they're not going to have any forgiveness because they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And apparently he's never read Revelation 22 or Revelation 14 that talk about people who receive the mark of the beast that are definitely going to hell and that people who have tampered and changed God's words having their name removed from the book of life. But I probably want all of those people. He's, yeah, yeah, okay, you won someone who's blasphemed the Holy Ghost to the Lord. Yeah, right. Sorry, false prophet, I'm not going to believe you. All right, I'm going to go to the last point now. I'm gonna, the point that I skipped, I, I want to I do this. See, their site says that guilt is a bad thing. Oh, you shouldn't have guilt, which is what the sodomites say. They don't want to feel guilt for what they've done, even though they know it's wrong. Just like the, 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 the woman's letter that I would read. She knew it was wrong. She wanted to do it, but she knew it was wrong. The sodomites are plagued. They are plagued. They are not happy. That's why they commit suicide. They kill themselves because it's not happy at all because they know it's not natural. They know it's not right. They're burning in their lust, but they want to do it anyways. Right. It is self-destructive. Right. But they want to say, oh, you shouldn't have guilt. The Bible says that godly sorrow worketh repentance. It's good to feel guilty when you do something wrong because that's going to prevent you from doing it wrong again, the same thing later on. You need to have that sorrow. You need to have that feeling of guilt. Hey, I did something wrong. You ought to feel guilty because you are guilty. Don't try to remove the guilt. God has given us that feeling, that conscience to feel some type of guilt when we do something wrong to help us. Don't try to eliminate. Their website says guilt. Well, guilt's not a good thing. You shouldn't be guilting people. Uh, yeah, you should. Yeah, I mean, the sodomites especially, but... And then they say, you know, their site says that labels are bad things. I kind of went over that. Here's the last quote I want to I wanna go over. Turn, if you would, to... Um, turn, if you would, to Genesis 18. Last quote from their article, and then we'll be done. And if you... Look, I'm teaching about protecting your children... We need to give them knowledge. They need to understand God's word, what they should do and what they shouldn't do, first and foremost. They need to be protected. They need parents are going to look out for them. Make sure they're not getting ungodly influences. They need to be aware that there's wicked people, that there's sodomites, that there's, there, are, there are predators that are out to seek and to destroy and to take their lives and to defile them and to, and to ruin their life. And we need to watch out, especially as parents, for this type of bizarre, twisted doctrine that's even being promoted in churches that we don't ever let our guard down against the, the wickedness and the predators that are out there. And this is why I'm exposing you to this so you don't get deceived by it at some point of someone trying to come up with their cute doctrine and showing you all the various places where it doesn't add up and what they're saying makes no sense. Because they have the statements that you could read the one statement and say, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. But then they, they, they backdoor in the, the acceptance of the sodomites, even though they'll tell you, oh, we don't, you know, we don't accept their, that sin. We still say it's a, real, it's a real bad sin. Here's their statement. He said, Jesus said that if he had gone to Sodom, they would have been spared. And they quote Matthew 11, 20, 24. Now, is that true? Did Jesus say that if he had gone to Sodom, they would have been spared? Nope. That's not what he said, but that's what he's claiming. He just puts the reference in there, but doesn't actually tell you what it is. You know what it actually says? And now Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works, 
which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. That does not say if Jesus had gone to Sodom, it would have remained. It said if the mighty works that had been done in this other city would have been done in Sodom, then it would have remained. Now, it's also not saying at what point those works would have been done in Sodom. Because I'll tell you what, Jesus did go to Sodom. If Jesus had gone, and he said, here's what he says. He says, uh, even if Sodom is redeemable, then I will give <coughs> all men the truth that there is deliverance in Christ. Be very clear. My desire is to take Jesus to Sodom. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> Jesus did go to Sodom. Look at, in Genesis chapter 18. We're see where Abraham meets these visitors on their way. Verse 2, And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. One of those three was the Lord. Because if you jump down to verse number 20, he's having this conversation with one of the three still. It says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. He's saying, I'm on my way right now to verify what I've been hearing about this place. And this is a physical incarnation of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, appeared unto Abraham with the two angels. Those three. Now, in Genesis 19, you see, you only hear about the two angels because Jesus already saw what was going on. They were sent in there then to deliver Lot out. Jesus was all, had his own plan going on of raining fire and brimstone down upon that city. And he said, hey, you guys go in there and get Lot out. I'm going to judge Sodom. When Jesus went to Sodom, he didn't go in there and try to win people to Christ. He went in there and destroyed the wicked city. Look at verse, uh, chapter 19, verse number 12. I'll just prove it to you. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. He didn't send us to save it. He sent us to destroy it. God's judgment came down upon it. And look, what other place has he ever done that to? Ever in the history of mankind. The only other thing that's even close is when God sent the flood and wiped out the whole world who was doing extremely wickedly. He wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah, raining fire and brimstone upon them. And we have in Jude a reference to this event that says in verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, queer flesh. Oh, don't use labels, Bible. Don't call it strange. They're not going after strange. Yeah, they're going after strange flesh. It's not natural. <coughs> Are set forth for an example. What? You mean... That wasn't just for those people at that time. No, they set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. There's that term again, the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. <clears throat> his statement is completely false. about Jesus and about what would Jesus do. Jesus already did it. Right. He already destroyed them and he destroyed them as an example saying, hey, listen up, look what happens. When you're going after, when you give yourselves over unto fornication and going after strange flesh, there's one result. Don't be deceived by these people who want to Reach out and open up the door to the predator. You know, and the one thing about Sodom, if, you, if, you know, if you're familiar with the story, 
is that all the men compassed the, the house around where the two angels came in and it said it was both old and young. Yeah. Old and young. Let that sink in. Young people were there trying to get at those angels also because they had been defiled and corrupted and, and preyed upon by the older men that, that corrupted their hearts and their minds into this perversion. That's reality. And I know it's not fun to think about it. It's disgusting. It turns my stomach. I don't ever want to think about it. But you know what? We have to think about it if we're going to be diligent about protecting our children and making sure that we realize no matter how weird or off the wall it may seem that these people exist and that you need to be diligent to watch after your children and not let them be in situations where they might become defiled because 10, 20 minutes, it's all it takes and they could be ruined for life destroyed and defiled. And I, you know, these other churches can, can end up inviting all these reprobates into their church and they could go to hell. Because that's what's going to happen to them. The, the church is going to be destroyed when you bring in children of Belial into the midst of it. That's right. And that's going to be the end result. That's where you get all these, these weirdo churches and where they end up. They start with just being more tolerant, more accepting and saying, hey, oh, you're a eunuch. We're going to put you in charge of the children's ministry. Because you could be trusted because I, I read that from, from a real popular guy on the internet. I, I bought this book that said that God made you that way and you have special talents. So I'm going to leave you alone with my kids. It's bizarro land. But you know what? The Bible says there's, there's a great falling away. We're in the end times. Amen. And this is what's happening in the fundamental Baptist churches. The, you know, the people who are supposed to be the most in line with God's word and standing on the truth. They're, let, they're allowing perversion into the church. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your clear teaching, your clear words, dear Lord, on... Um, and you give us so many warnings, Lord, about the wicked people, especially we saw it over and over again through the book of Proverbs, how these people exist and they're real and, and we need to, to make sure that we just at least have a good knowledge of this so that we can't be overly trusting of people and, and allowing our children just to, to go wherever and to be out of our sight. Dear Lord, help us as parents to be diligent as ever to make sure that our children are protected and stay safe. They're protected from the, from the evils that are out there on the internet. They're protected from the, the false doctrines and the, and the predators that are out that, that are trying to sneak in and beguile unstable souls, dear Lord. We pray for your protection upon us, dear God, and to give us the wisdom and knowledge that we need in order to do what's right by you and to protect our children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.